Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider, Hawaii's weekly show about association living for both board members and homeowners alike. We've been doing this show. I think this is over 170 episodes we've done so far. But I want to begin by wishing everybody a mele kalikimaka, happy holidays, and, and hope you're safe during these difficult COVID times. Today's show is by request of some of our viewers who emailed me and asked me to again review what associations can do regarding delinquencies. And we want to talk about that not only for the scope what the normal procedure is, but maybe with a little footnote about the COVID times we're now in. So I ask a really great lawyer who's a good friend of mine, Kapono Kiyakona, to join me today and to uh, talk about uh, delinquencies. So welcome, Kapono, uh, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, thank you, Richard. I've been uh, practicing for about 20 years now. Um, uh, partner in Porter McGuire Kiyakona. We focus mainly on managing and, and, and assisting condos and other community associations. We handle their delinquencies. We, we treat ourselves as a full service law firm for that aspect. Um, from governing documents to the smallest uh, delinquency that needs to be handled. That's what we cover. So w when we talk about uh, delinquencies, that's something I, I cover quite a bit. And it's something that I think we're seeing not as many as I expected initially, but we're seeing quite a few more lately. Right? Well, it's interesting. Uh, um, I went to a seminar, a national seminar with CAI, and uh, I'm going to repeat what they said, which I can only repeat what they said, is that they're saying before COVID, delinquencies in condos ran 9 to 10% throughout the industry. This is throughout the United States. This is not just the way. And pre, post COVID now, delinquencies are still running 9 to 10%. They haven't seen a major shift. But the problem is for condos, you know, they budget on what we call zero sum budgeting. They have to collect from everybody to pay their bills and fund their reserves. So a 10% delinquency means something's not getting paid or reserves aren't being funded. So can you briefly just take us through, forget COVID and, and the challenges, kind of what the normal steps are that condos should be doing with regard to uh, collecting delinquencies? Certainly. So you have your standard procedure, and I think it's important that everyone in a condo understand what that procedure is. So normally you pay monthly, let's say you miss a, a month or two, you will get your warning letters coming from the managing agent. Depending on how the contract is for the managing agent, those warning letters, what we typically see is about three month, uh, three warning letters from the managing agent. Uh, the timing can be anywhere from a month and a half to three months or so. Uh, worth of delinquencies. Um, once they go through that, it gets sent to us. As the attorney, we are sometimes referred to as a debt collector. It, there's a lot deeper in there. Let's not worry about that for our purposes. But you send out a, a 30 day demand letter to the owner, right? So I have 30 days to respond, challenge, pay it off, anything. After those 30 days are up, we file a lien. Once that lien is recorded, we send a post lien demand letter. Following that, you go through the foreclosure process. Now, that's the basic of it. That, that's the most generalized term you're going to go with. There's all kinds of steps in between that can happen, payment plans, discussions, um, partial payments, things along those lines. Now, do you think payment plans are a good solution to boards if a person contacts you and I'll make it up so that I lost my job or my mother got sick or whatever. Um, um, and, and if you are going to have a payment plan, are there any kind of basic rules like uh, don't get further delinquent or whatever? Yeah, generally payment plans are a good idea, um, especially for boards. You want to, payment plans do the best job of balancing both the concerns of the association and the concerns of the owner. Um, you know, sometimes people get in a rough spot, they can't pay it, but the association needs to be paid. 
through your payment plans, I, you want to make sure that the association is continued to pay to be paid throughout the process. So you want to say, okay, we'll give you a payment plan. We'll give you a 12 month payment plan. You can pay your delinquency off in 12 months. But during that time, you have to stay current with your monthly maintenance fees in addition to the 12 month payment plan. So let's say someone owes $1,200 and their monthly maintenance fees are $200. They're on a 12 month payment plan, very simple. They continue paying the $200 to the maintenance fee. Then they pay the extra $100 a month to pay down that delinquency. Now does the statute require the board to give a payment plan or is that something strictly optional within the board? So there's a requirement to do payment plans under certain circumstances um, during the foreclosure process. Since that's a requirement, it's just good governance for the association to be willing to do it at any time. There's, there's no harm and it's almost foolhardy to say, okay, well, we will go to this process so that you can trigger the payment plan. If someone wants to get on a payment plan early, we always recommend that the boards do it. So when you look at this, you know, whether it be a payment plan or just an owner who's paying maintenance fees. I know that in my time as a president of a condominium managing agent, we would find things that just go wrong that can delay the process forever. And a good example would be in Maui, I had a case where uh, two people owned a unit, but they weren't married. They were just uh, joint tenants, I guess it's called. And they were delinquent and then the first person died without a will and it stuck it in probate court. And yeah. then we got through that. And then the second person died without a will. And so I, I want to say it took a couple of two, three years to resolve that. But uh, tell us beside my example I gave you, what kind of thing can go wrong that really disrupt the normal collection process like bankruptcy and things like that? Can you give us some ideas what, what they might be? Certainly, certainly. I, and to be fair, what you've described is essentially the worst case scenario. Probate is where all timely actions go to die. That's just no pun intended on that. Things will take forever. Um, bankruptcy is certainly one of those places. There's, there's an interesting tick in the bankruptcy code which has caused some issues for condo associations. And the distinction has to be made between the type of bankruptcy that someone's filed. So the difference between a chapter seven and a chapter 13 bankruptcy. Just briefly, chapter seven is essentially a forgiveness of debts. Chapter 13 is an extensive payment plan. Chapter 13 goes anywhere from three to five years long. With that being said, there's a trick within and I don't want to say tricks, probably the wrong term, but there's an issue with the language that's used in chapter 13 versus what's used in chapter seven. If someone files under chapter seven, they are continuous, they are still required to pay the maintenance fees following the filing of the bankruptcy. That's called post petition, right? Under chapter 13, there's recent case law that interpreted a certain section that doesn't exist under chapter seven, which treats the debt essentially like a mortgage, meaning that the future costs are not allowed to be claimed against the, the individual owner who filed for chapter 13. So what you end up doing is your right is just to foreclose. You don't have the right to go after that owner for any post petition delinquency. So that causes a, an issue because often people will use chapter 13 as a way to get back on their feet, but it doesn't help when the association's sole remedy is to foreclose on that. Um, it also affects associations when someone's using bankruptcy courts to delay. Um, we've had several instances where people are unscrupulous about the way they uh, file for bankruptcy and require extensive amounts of litigation to do it. And it, it's not something that's helpful, but it's something you have to face. 
sometimes things go sideways and you have to deal with that. And then I don't know if you're aware about the new sub chapter five of chapter 11 bankruptcy that just passed February 20th, 2020. And um, uh, I happen to be one of two people appointed in the state of Hawaii to be a sub chapter five bankruptcy trustee and it works. It adds another little quirk. I don't know exactly how it applies to condos yet, but uh, you as a sole provider and individual can file for sub chapter five chapter under chapter 11 reorganization which is different than seven and 13 as far as how it operates. And uh, uh, the thing I do know because uh, I've, I have a case I'm doing right now is that the post-petition rule does apply to that. They have to stay current with uh, yeah. the post-petition expenses. But um, uh, the problem is that whenever you get a filing, whether it be bankruptcy or probate, it slows down the process is what we're saying. It's gonna be extra steps, extra costs uh, to try to secure your position. Yes. And it doesn't help anybody when there's extra costs involved. That's how about, how about in the old days, we used to talk about cutting off utilities and services and collecting rent from a tenant and investment property. Is that still active and alive? And th those are still useful. The, there hasn't been much change to that. What you're seeing, though, is there's less appreciation for the cutting off of utilities. Right. There's there's greater claims, and then that's not even getting into the allegation that you're harming people during the the pandemic. Right. In terms of the rent intercept, I'm a fan of rent intercept, provided the person has a a legitimate um, rental agent. Um, the 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 hardest part of rent intercepts is it doesn't have the teeth it needs. Yeah, I remember that. I remember on the utility side, we used to always say, well, you don't want to be turning off the electricity and you don't know the guys on a heart lung machine, for example. But what we found was really effective, by the way, was turning off the TV cable. Because that yeah. got the most attention out of anything. They couldn't watch their NFL football game or whatever it was. So uh, we kind of, uh, in our practice, we uh, tried to focus on the TV cable and not touch the other like water and and electricity because uh, we thought there was too much liability to it. Absolutely. That's the safest move. No one can say I can't live with, well, they can say they can't live without their TV, but then it's just hyperbole. Yeah, that's true. Well, you know, we've kind of gone through the basics and we're, we're due for a break right now. So uh, what I wanted to say before we go on break is we talked about foreclosures and there's been some, some pre-court rulings. There's been some changes in that whole foreclosure idea recognizing also there's a, a, a proclamation by the governor and all these different things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a short one minute break. We're gonna come back with my good friend, Kapono Kiyakona, and we're gonna talk about uh, the hammer, the foreclosure and how that fits in today's world. So we'll be right back in one minute. Welcome back to Condo Insider. Richard Emery here with my good friend, attorney uh, Kapono Kiyakona. We're talking about foreclosures in the first half. We talked about the normal process where the managing agent sends some letters and then they send a demand letter and then they follow a lien and they send a post lien letter. And, and, and that kind of goes through normal realizing that somewhere along the way, people file bankruptcy and die and have probate court and things that can really slow it down. Uh, the key takeaway to me was if you have a delinquent owner, 
talk to them and try to get a payment plan where you preserve the fact they'll pay the current and that they will uh, pay the delinquency over a specified period of time. And that's probably cheaper, better, and faster for everybody if you can get people to agree to a payment plan. But what I ended up with was the comments that we've gone through all these things that one of the rights of an association under certain circumstances is to foreclose on the unit and take it back. And in the old days, there used to be, maybe even the new days, uh, non-judicial or judicial foreclosure. And then our Hawaii Supreme Court came out with a recent ruling. So let's begin with that, Kapano. Tell us about the recent ruling and tell us how that affects condos. All right. I have to watch my tongue on this because I have personal feelings on it that, that aren't, uh, that may contradict what the, the Supreme Court justices have said. Um, so the way it's working now is the legislature has brought out and clarified a bunch of issues that the Supreme Court originally and, and Intermediate Court of Appeals had originally had issues with. Right. The legislature said, like associations has all, have all, always had this ability, and we've recognized that by statute. That being said, the Hawaii Supreme Court disagreed on some issues and are still requiring, potentially requiring that it be in the association's project documents in order for them to do foreclosures. The problem you'll see, and uh, for those of you on boards who've been dealing with your attorneys on this, uh, your attorneys will tell you that the main problem is we don't know which way it's going to come down when the Supreme Court, if they ever get their hands on this again, if this comes up again on another issue, because they've already done something that is essentially saying they disagree with what the legislature said. So what we've done and what I know a, a few of my colleagues around town have done is said the risk reward factor exists for non-judicial foreclosures only when you have that right specifically enumerated in your project documents. Um, that's the best way to look at it and the best way to treat it. And it's the safest way to avoid litigation. One of the things that are interesting, and I didn't tell you about this before we talked about the show, is that one of our state senators has approached our industry with the idea of saying, look, let's provide like in the law that boards of directors and or a low threshold of owners, maybe it's 51% of the meeting or maybe 51% overall, has the authority to amend the project documents to allow for non-judicial foreclosure, which takes away the argument of contract in the sense because the contract provides for amendments to the contract through this process. And so the state senator is in the process of drafting a bill to find an easy mechanism for associations to amend their project documents to allow non-judicial foreclosure by either a board being allowed to do it and or some low threshold of owners to do it. How do you, what do you think about that? I think, I think that's a good plan. Uh, realistically, as, as you know, and many of your listeners know, condos are creatures of statute. They're essentially created and governed by the statute. The statute specifically says this, that associations can do non-judicial foreclosures. Um, you also can go back, and this was back when there was 514A and 514B, um, there was a provision that allowed you to opt into and use any part of 514B based on a 50% threshold vote. So it, there's precedence for that exact action saying, this is in the statute. It only makes sense that you should be able to govern your, to amend your governing documents when discuss it, when you wanna do something that's allowed in the statute. Yeah, well, I think that's, uh, I can tell you being on the, Community Association to Legislative Action Committee and also on the Board of Governors of uh, White Council Community Association. We're all working with the Senator who's a lawyer and uh, industry lawyers to try to perfect some language to be introduced in 2021. But the second part of this issue, which goes back to um, some recent legislation, 
in the old days, we used to do something called priority of payment. And so when we got, I, I would tell boards and owners, it's kind of like you get your visa bill with all these charges on it. You send them one check. They don't apply it first to Macy, second to the Saks Fifth Avenue, third to Safeway. I mean, the computers, you know, they have to have some kind of pecking order on how they apply the cash, leaving something delinquent. And on associations, that ends up with you have maintenance fees, special assessments, maybe utilities, you rent a storage locker, they assess you for an HO6 policy, then you paid late, so you have a late fee, a legal fee, and a fine. And, and, and so they changed the law with regret with respect to how associations can apply payment. Can you talk about that a little bit? Certainly, certainly. So I'm going to avoid the, the sort of in-between because when we first changed it, there was, it was, you know, I hate to criticize, but it was poorly written. Um, so a lot of people had difficulty understanding it. So right now the way it operates is priority of payments are created under the statute. It's just the priority is that your maintenance fees get paid first. Any amount you put in that goes to your maintenance fees, if there's leftovers, that goes to differing levels of common expenses. And then ultimately it can cover individual expenses and then ultimately late fees, late interest and attorney's fees, which is essentially backwards from the um, priority of payments as they used to be. Yeah, it's kind of there. It puts us in another perspective. In the old days, not there now, everybody needs to know not now, the payments would be first applied to legal late fees and interest. Thus, the last thing applied to would be maintenance fees. Thus, you had a delinquent on your maintenance fee, and thus you got foreclosed on. Now the law is written, you first have to apply it to common expenses, I'm going to say, the maintenance fees, the special assessments. Then there's some intermediary things like the storage locker, you might have some metering utilities and things along that line um, that, that is next. And then you get to the late fees, legal fees and fines. And so if a person has legal fees and late fees and fines that are disputed and they're paying their regular common expenses, you can't foreclose now on those legal fees and, and late fees as I understand it. So how do you collect that money? Okay, so primarily the, there's a twofold issue on that. Right. One, let's assume that the association can do non-judicial foreclosures. So if they have the right to do non-judicial foreclosures and the only thing remaining are legal fees, late fees and fines, the ability to, non to do non-judicial foreclosures is cut off. You can never do a non-judicial foreclosure just on those types of delinquencies. So you have to go to court and you have to tell a judge, this is what we're doing. Um, so that's the way you handle it on that aspect. They can challenge it and you have to go to, through mediation and you have to take certain steps, but you can still act on that. It just delays the process. It's not a foregone conclusion that these amounts can never be collected against. You know, that would be a ludicrous interpretation of the statute. And I'm certain there are some debtors that are saying that, yes, that's how it should be, but that's not what we've seen. And we've been able to move forward on ones where that's the situation. Admittedly, the judges don't like seeing just late fees and, and legal, but when you're able to explain, judge, this is why the way the priority of payment works and this is what happened. They decided to only pay the maintenance fees after we've already gotten to this point of filing a foreclosure, therefore it's, it's realistic. Have you actually gone to court on things like this? And have, have you prevailed where the judges awarded the fine or the legal fees because of non-payment? Not enough. We have not foreclosed on that amount. We've been, we've been pushed to, to go a different route, but the judges are willing to award a, a judgment, a money judgment on those, those types of dollar figures. So does that also apply to the military? Okay, so military, realistically, Richard, I don't want to get too deep into it because the military exemptions cover a wide range of, of what can be done and when and how, right? So if we're talking 
just foreclosure. There's a distinction between when, if you're able to do a non-judicial foreclosure or not, premised on whether they're active, when they bought the property, um, whether they're in state or they are um, deployed out, out of state. So I'm not, I'm not trying to be cagey on this one, but there's, there's a lot of different levels on that one. So the answer is yes, it depends. And <laughs> we're down to our last two minutes of the show. I want to ask you one more question. So I need a kind of short, concise answer. And that is with the proclamation and COVID, can you do foreclosures right now? You can process it and you can start it. Um, the problem is with the proclamations, having the actual gathering and doing the actual auction, it's not allowed. Um, the, there's a way to argue around it, but you could run into trouble and you could be subject to challenge. Well, I want to thank you for being here today, but you know, with regard to delinquency, the short answer to hold this, if you pay your maintenance fees on time, you won't have a problem. We won't have this conversation. So I encourage everybody to pay their maintenance fees on time. I want to thank Capono for being with us today and sharing us your expertise. And I know you're the past president of CAI here locally. Thank you for all your work uh, in the industry. And I know you have a great firm you're with. And I want to thank you today and remind all of our guests that uh, we are going to continue through the holidays. There'll be a little bit of a hiatus. So you might see a repeat show here or there. But we hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday. Same to you, Kapono. And thank you all. Aloha and Mele Klikimaka. <laughs>